Taggart will be here presenting a talk about Fasology and Debian. Matt Taggart is a developer, a stream developer of Fasology and also the package maintainer in Debian. And he works uh, as assistant administrator in riseup.net. Please welcome Matt Taggart. Can you hear me yet? There we go, great. <clears throat> uh, first, uh, I would like a volunteer to, uh, someone please give me the name of a, a small package that you maintain. Uh, we're gonna use it for a demonstration in a minute. What's the name? Okay. Doesn't have too many directories or files. It's not very big. Okay. Do you want something to sign in the uh, SSH after files? I, I think this will be okay. So uh, bear with me a minute here. I'm just going to get the source and uh, upload it. Okay, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, now that's uh, processing and we'll take a look at it in a few minutes. <coughs> uh, as uh, was said, um, my name is Matt Taggart. I work for Rise Up Networks and I also work on the uh, upstream Fossology project and I'm a Fossology maintainer. So, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, HP had a problem. Uh, they had teams of engineers that were working on building uh, devices and they wanted to use FOSS software to uh, be able to derive those devices. Uh, they also had people working on software products that wanted to use FOSS libraries. Um, and also, uh, lots of people, uh, including a lot of us in this room, were asking them to ship Linux distributions because we wanted to be able to run Linux on, on uh, their hardware. Um, however, they had a problem. Sorry, technical difficulties here. I have to get my notes. Um, at the time, HP was a, a $40 billion company, and when you're that large, you have special problems that other people don't have. Um, when you're that large, you're... Um, quite a very large target for lawsuits. Um, the product teams at HP wanted to ship FOSS software, but HP's lawyers were really afraid of um, shipping anything that might cause them liability. Um, so finally, there was lots of debate among the engineers and the product teams wanting to ship things. Um, the lawyers agreed <coughs> if the software that was being shipped could be scanned in some way, and they could assess the risks of, of what risks this was going to present for the company. Um, and, and then they could sign off on those risks. They would allow it. Um, so 
there was work started on a, a scanner to uh, uh, begin um, scanning uh, for risks. Okay, so how do you determine the risks? Um, HP was actually okay with shipping copy left, you know, GPL type code. Uh, they just wanted to know exactly when they were doing it and make sure that they were ready to fulfill the source obligations um, and other uh, aspects of licenses. Uh, what they didn't want was uh, to accidentally ship some GPL code um, and have that come out and, you know, it would be a, a PR disaster, uh, but then also they may have to uh, begin uh, uh, shipping source for something they didn't want to. Um, so in order to help determine these things, uh, work was started on a, a tool that would automate the process of um, scanning software to look for these problems. Um, the tool would look through the software, report things uh, that the lawyers didn't like, and, and flag them for the lawyers to look at. Now, uh, depending on the product that, they, that we're talking about within HP, um, they might be scanning source code that was used to generate a firmware image that was going to go on some hardware device, or they might be scanning um, a package piece of, of FOSS software that was a library they were going to use in some application. Um, or the biggest thing is they might be scanning an ISO image of a Linux distribution that they intended to ship on their hardware. It was the uh, ISO images of distributions that really scared the lawyers the most because there's so many packages. Um, they were really worried that somewhere hidden down in the inside of this Linux distribution was going to be some license that told them they had to give away HP proprietary technology or something like that. So they were, they were terrified of that idea. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing the tool had to be able to do um, was recursively drill down through whatever it was given and pick it apart at the lowest level. In the case of a Linux distribution, you, you normally start with an ISO image uh, that you would be um, giving to someone, um, and then you start unpacking that, and inside that you have a whole directory hierarchy, and you have um, files that are compressed and, and zipped and um, tarred up and um, b-zipped and 7-zipped and every possible kind of format you can think of. Um, this tool needs to be able to uh, find these things. We refer to them as containers, you know, things like tarballs. And when it encounters them, open them up, look inside them, and, and keep going recursively all the way down the stack until they had expanded as much as they could. <clears throat> so the, the scanning evolved over time uh, based on requirements from the lawyers. They would have uh, things that they knew about that they wanted to make sure that that the company wouldn't do. And so gradually it grew um, from the ground up as, as a bunch of different regular expressions uh, for things that they wanted to look for, particular licenses, copyright declarations, um, other things like that. So um, it would scan through everything, and at the end it would produce a, a PDF document um, that could be given to the lawyers, and then they could review any problems that it found. Um, so this fulfilled what the lawyers wanted, which was to be able to review everything. Um, and so HP, using this process, began to ship um, FOSS software. Uh, but now there was another problem. It was kind of a mess. Um, when adding new things to look for and adding uh, support for new file types, that sort of thing, um, first of all, you had to rerun the entire analysis to get a new report. Uh, because it was it was pretty stupid about how it just scanned through things and did a report as it went, um, and the code was was really just this huge monolithic mess um, that was primarily written by one person and only that person knew how to understand it. So um, it had worked well and it, and it let HP ship FOSS software for, for quite a while, uh, but it was time to uh, to redesign. So work was started on a new design. Um, the various different functions that existed in the, in the previous tool were split into different components. Um, before, the unpacker uh, used to unpack things on every run. Um, instead, the, the decision was made. Um, it would unpack things and uh, put them into a file repository. Um, there would be... Um, the, the things that did the scanning would be split out into a pluggable architecture 
um, and we refer to those as agents. Um, and then you can plug in whatever kind of scans you want, and it's very modular. Um, the agents, after they scan the files, uh, produce results that they uh, put into a database. Uh, there's a scheduler uh, that kind of sits in the middle of everything and, and uh, controls uh, how things ev everything runs. And then, and then there's a couple different user interfaces. Uh, primarily a web interface is the main way you interact with it, but there's also some command line tools uh, to help you automate uh, uh, doing uploads. And uh, some examples of uh, agents, you know, the, I mentioned uh, the, the primary reason the tool was written originally was uh, to fulfill the legal obligations. And so uh, a couple of the agents, uh, there's a, a license scanning agent. There's actually several different types of license scanning agents now. Um, the scan and look for uh, license text and boilerplates and, and uh, source files and that sort of thing. There's also a separate agent that looks explicitly for um, copyright declarations. Oh, thank you. Um, another interesting one that we have is a, a metadata agent that knows about metadata contained in files, and so uh, when it encounters files, it, it knows about, like, uh, for example, uh, um, JPEGs have uh, um, metadata uh, tags in them. It can scan those and make those available um, in the database, which is kind of interesting because, you know, sometimes somebody might put some text in there, like, this JPEG is copyright so-and-so and licensed under these terms. Um, that's something that... that uh, the software agents would like to be able to determine. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk in particular about um, this unpacking thing we talked about a minute ago, and in particular talking about uh, unpacking Debian software packages. Um, we're all pretty familiar with uh, the, the, the basic upstream um, software package, and of course there's, there's new um, source package uh, formats, but um, so originally when the unpacker tool was set up, um, if it encountered a Debian source package uh, within an ISO or within a directory tree that you had uploaded, um, it would run the scan on, on the files in the source package. Um, and that's good, you know, it, it would encounter the Origitar GZ and it would uncompress it and it would untar it and it would go through all that and uh, it, would, it would run its scans on there. Um, it would also encounter the diff GZ and unzip it and look at that. Um, but one thing to think about is, uh, suppose you have, somewhere in the Ridgetar Z, you have a license declaration that says, this is GPL v2, um, and say in the diff, you have a patch that applies to that that says, oh yeah, we're going to adjust that, and we're going to say, no, it's not GPL v2, it's GPL v2 or later, um, or we're going to put a, the word not somewhere in the middle of the license that's going to totally negate what it means. Um, or we're going to change copyright dates, or uh, you know, in terms of other agents that you might uh, do scanning with, um, you you know, you might patch C files and say you have an agent that's uh, um, scanning for a particular software vulnerability, and now in the Debian diff, you just added in a vul vulnerability. Um, before it wouldn't it wouldn't find that. Uh, so uh, just recently, the unpacker was extended. Um, to know about Debian source packages and can treat them as a container. And so when it encounters a DSC file, um, it looks to make sure the other things are there, un does the uh, unpack of the source, um, and then it scans uh, the unpacked Debian source package, which is pretty nice. So I mentioned I'm the uh, um, Fossology maintainer in Debian, and, and uh, uh, it's in unstable right now. I think uh, one of the most recent uploads is about to move into testing. Um, if you want to play with Fossology, it's uh, just a matter of app get install Fossology. Once it's installed, it sets up most things on its own. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do is um, you need to set up the Apache configuration. There's examples in the package, um, but really that's kind of a, a site-specific thing, so uh, we leave that to the, uh, the user to, uh, to set up. Okay, so here's this picture again of, of the new structure. One of the neat things about the way Fossology is structured um, when this rewrite was done um, was we knew that potentially 
uh, and scanning large amounts of software and, and having things that are very uh, computation intensive, uh, that you might actually want to run some of these things on separate machines. And so everything was designed from the ground up um, to allow these things to be on separate machines. And likewise, when I uh, packaged the Debian package, I built it such that um, individual components could go on separate machines and that would work just fine. So um, if you have to get install Fossology, that's actually a meta package that pulls in everything you need to make it run on one system. Uh, but if you want, um, and you have a, the need to, to scan lots of software or run lots of computational intensive agents, you can do things like have a whole cluster of machines running as agents, have one separate database machine, um, have a separate machine running, say, the scheduler and the user interface. Um, the other nice thing is that um, the way everything communicates is over SSH um, and it just uses the normal file system for the repository. Um, so, for example, we use NFS um, for the file repository. So if you, if you do want to set something up in a cluster situation uh, in the readme.debian file, there's instructions in there about how to go about doing that. Okay, so I mentioned some of the existing agents, the license agent, the copyright agent, that sort of thing, but now that this is written as a generic framework, uh, pretty much anything that you could use to scan software you can write um, an agent for that would plug into Fossology. Um, and so uh, we've had a lot of ideas of other things that we could do. Um, some of the biggest users of Fossology so far are people that are producing um, firmware for in embedded devices and they're using Linux and they uh, need to make sure that they um, know about the licenses. So they were, uh, you know, most people are attracted because of the license scanning right now, but really this could be used for doing any sort of software analysis. Um, and, and some of the things that we thought of in particular um, would also be interesting to those same people that are um, doing uh, embedded systems. Uh, one that seems to sh pop up in the news from time to time is you'll often hear about people uh, shipping some sort of device that makes it out the door with a virus on it. So you have this new embedded device and people plug it into their home computer or, or you know, whatever it is and that ends up infecting things. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't take, uh, you know, say the clam antivirus tool and write an agent that went around it and then before uh, people uh, ship software as, uh, as part of their uh, quality assurance process, they could uh, run Fossology on it with talking about licenses. We could do scans like uh, search for viruses, search for, I guess you could run Spam Assassin and search for spam to see if there's any spam in their source code or something like that. Um, but likewise, you could run all sorts of software analysis tools. You could run you know, C tools like Lint or, or, uh, or compiler preprocessors that look for compiler warnings or um, all sorts of things. And there's no reason you couldn't scan binaries as well. Um, I mean, we can upload things to Fossology, and generally we're wanting to upload source code, but it doesn't have to be source code. You could upload binaries, and if you had something uh, that was able to, to analyze binaries and, and look for particular uh, sets of instructions, I guess, that you, that you wouldn't want, uh, I could flag those as well. So, um, one of the things I want to talk about in, the, in this talk is uh, how we can use Fossology and Debian in particular. Um, and I've thought of, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about how Fossology is able to unpack Debian source packages now, which is nice. Um, but we could probably write all sorts of agents um, that would do Debian specific kind of scanning. The, the, the first couple that I've thought of is we could write a Lintian agent. Um, that when people upload things, if you encountered a Debian package, you say, great, send it off to Lintian, get the results back, put them in the database, um, make those results available f uh, through the user interface. We could also do PU parts. Um, there's a bunch of other things. Um, right now, I have been scanning uh, squeeze source DVDs. Uh, currently, the, the CD image team produces uh, weekly updates of, of squeeze DVDs and I've been taking those and uploading them to Fossology and uh, doing the scanning and making the results available. Uh, and I'll show you that in a few minutes here. Um, but potentially, you know, there's lots of other things we could do. Uh, one thing that might be kind of interesting to the FTP master team is eventually if we get this automated well enough, it might be kind of nice if when things get stuck in the new queue, uh, they could automatically be uploaded to Fossology and then the, the FTP master team would be able to go and scan the results and look and see if there's any license problems or weird copyright issues or um, or any other kind of quality issues that whatever agents we have installed determine. 
Um, the other thing that would be kind of nice to be able to do, um, in addition to just doing it for new packages, is we should be able to audit the entire archive um, looking for particular licenses and uh, copyrights um, that we're interested in. Um, currently, we have um, the copyright file on Debian packages that um, is kind of a pseudo standard format where you indicate copyrights and licenses. I think there's been some people talking about uh, making that uh, more of a standard format that would be machine readable. Eventually, we could do something like have um, Fossology do a scan, compare with what's already listed in the source package, and report any di differences. And so, you know, the maintainer may have put stuff in the copyright file that says, here's, here's what licenses this package is under. But if Fossology finds something hidden in one of the, the files way down, it would be uh, nice to know about that. Um, I also wanted to comment that there's a couple other uh, projects within Debian that are, that are doing very Fossology-like things, um, and uh, like the, uh, what's it called, UDD, Ultimate Debian Database or something like that, and trying to integrate those things. Um, and Fossology isn't necessarily a, a replacement for that. It could probably eventually be made to do things, but it's designed at kind of a higher level. Um, it's not Debian specific, so I think some of those other projects are, are nice in that because they're Debian specific, they can pre present information um, in a more uh, Debian specific way. So just about two weeks ago, um, I set up fossology.debian.net, and this is a, a Fossology uh, install. Uh, that we can use uh, to analyze things. And uh, uh, previous to this, uh, I had been running some of this analysis on uh, one of the upstream installs. Um, uh, but this is one that's specifically uh, that we can use for Debian. And, and I'd like to eventually automate and have um, things uh, get scanned um, there on a regular basis. In a minute here, I'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. If I can find my web browser, hopefully our um, analysis from earlier has completed. Okay, so this is the uh, the Fossology user interface, and um, this is what it looks like when you're logged in. Um, this is kind of the main landing page. Uh, if you want to upload files, I mentioned there's a command line user interface, but you can also uh, go to this upload directory and you can um, upload it via your web browser. Uh, you can give it a URL that it can pull it from, um, or you can give it a local path on the server um, that it can grab things from, which is pretty nice when you're uh, doing uh, DVD-sized ISOs is you don't want to uh, try and upload those via your web browser. Um, after you've done the upload, um, there is a job queue. Let's go see. Oops. Let's go see if uh, our job that we uploaded earlier is there. Oh, timed out. So here's a, here's a job that I ran earlier. Um, we'll get the whole. I bet you our job earlier already finished. This is a, a Debian DVD that's still running. History. Oh, I don't know where the other one went. Did it? There it is. Okay, so um, hold on a second. I'll go back and look. Uh, it looks like everything everything finished on that job. So now we can click on it, and it'll take us to the browse section. Um, and we see we have this directory, and I uploaded the source package, and here's the. Um, uh, the different files. So now within the UI, you can drill down um, within these files and start looking for things. By default, you're just looking at the directory view. Um, up here, you can turn on different features uh, depending on what you want to be looking for. Um, so what we'll go ahead and do is we'll click on the original Z and we're in there, and we'll turn on the license scan. Um, this, there's two currently two license scanning agents. One's called Nomos. Uh, the other is called BSAM. Uh, BSAM is, uh, was the original one, and it's, it's very thorough, but it's kind of slow. It's based on some algorithms um, that were used for matching uh, DNA 
uh, sequence sequences, and uh, I think it's a, some algorithm from the 80s or something, and uh, people have figured out some faster things since then, but uh, this is the one that we had up and uh, was the primary one up until the most recent release. Okay, so we clicked on that, and now what it's doing is it's showing us, okay, in this directory I found, um, these are all the different licenses that I found and, and the count of, uh, of what I found. Um, and then we can, uh, as we drill down through the, through the directories, um, it will start, you know, showing us fewer amounts here. We can also do things like, um, like for example, let's do GPL of exception. We'll click on show there. That will give us a list of all the licenses of that category um, and what files they're in. Go back here. We can also say, um, let's see if I remember how to do this right. Um, if you click on the license name, it'll highlight it in the category over here and which files it's in. Um, we can also uh, click on view to view the file. And now we're in, we have the file down below us, and you'll see that it's highlighted here um, with the bits that it found. So, you know, so there's query and FSF um, license there, and there's a GPL down there. So that's the BSAM scanning. Nomos is, is very similar. Um, we'll do uh, copyright as well. So here's a copyright scan. Um, the copyright scan, there's a, there's a disclaimer here right now. The, the person that wrote this agent uh, put this in here, but basically said there's a lot of false positives right now, but, but it was determined still to be useful enough to be included. Um, you know, so it looks for these sorts of strings, um, and, and some in particular um, that it knows might show up that have a certain, certain set of dates that you might be interested in. So, uh, and it, it's very similar to the other one. You can click on it, it will take you to the file and show you uh, where that was. One other thing I hadn't had a chance to talk about yet is this concept of a bucket browser. Um, that's a new feature that was added in the most recent release. Um, so we have a couple license scanners and they have, uh, they know about lots of different licenses. Um, and what the, the bucket browser allows you to do is it allows you to sort those licenses into categories that you care about. And so, um, for example, we could make a um, okay for Debian category and a not okay for Debian category, and we could put the licenses into that. Um, and then that makes it real easy if we upload a, a Debian source DVD um, and run the scan, uh, we can just say, show me everything that's not okay for Debian, and it will highlight and, and pop everything out and show us if there's anything in there. Um, I would like to do this. Um, as far as I know, there doesn't exist a canonical list of which licenses are okay and which licenses aren't. Uh, there's something in the wiki, uh, but it was written by a developer, not by FTP Master. I think FTP Master probably has their own uh, list of requirements somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Um, uh, the Fedora project has done a really good job on their wiki of documenting um, the licenses that they consider acceptable and the ones that they don't. Um, and so uh, I think we have uh, a set of bucket lists for Fedora, and so it's really easy now to look at Fedora and be able to click on something. Uh, there's a developer in Fedora, uh, Tom Calloway, I think, that's done a really good job on, on that because uh, they were doing some auditing a while back where they um, were audit auditing for GPLv3. Um, also, uh, I think they made the decision not to include um, any proprietary codecs, and so they were looking for those sorts of things. So they, they uh, have done a good job of figuring this out, and I'd like to uh, uh, start pushing this in Debian, of you know, trying to get the Debian legal team, FTP master, everybody else who cares together, and... Uh, come up with some canonical lists of these are things we think okay and these are things that we don't. Um, and, you know, they don't have to be definitive. We can just say these are the things we're sure are okay and these are the things we're sure are not. They don't have to list everything, but it would at least would be a good start. I want to go back to the license scan here. Um, and go up at, to a slightly higher level. So a minute ago I talked about unpacking Debian source packages. You can see uh, we have three different files that are in the source package, but it was also smart enough to say, oh yeah, this is a source package, unpack it, and then you can uh, drill down and look at that view as well. Um, so uh, just see if we can embarrass Eric here. Um, I think all these licenses look okay. Um, I don't see anything that pops out as me as being particularly bad for Debian, but uh, <laughs> I was hoping we'd find a... Uh, well, actually, I wasn't hoping, but I was worried we were going to find uh, some nasty license in there. 
So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's a short demo of, uh, of how it looks. Um, I'm uh, welcome to, I'd be happy to go through and show you other stuff in here, or if you have other questions, uh, go ahead, uh, Vito. Uh, do we have a mic? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, one, um, I just wanted to, the first thing is I wanted to comment that while um, new processing is sort of an obvious place to use this, the place I've always been more concerned about are just sort of random uploads of packages that have already been accepted into the archive where upstream makes some license revision. Uh, one of the ones the lawyers really want to understand, they're not afraid of it, they just want to understand it, is when a GPL version changes, whether that's two to two or any later, or two or any later to three or any later, and that sort of thing. So it seems to me that, that you know, if we get an instance of this that's running well enough, um, plugging it in so that it actually watches, you know, every source package upload would be, and in, 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 in some way reports anything that looks like it's changed on that upload would, would be really interesting. Um, the second thing I wanted to comment on is that I think the easiest way to get to a bucketized list would be to start by taking a scan of everything that's in main and everything that's in non-free and using the licenses found to seed the two. And mm -hmm. my suspicion is that in the process, anything that comes up in the main scan that you know somebody freaks out about will be easy to 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 notice and handle. And that actually led me sort of the last thing I wanted to ask you about. I know that when we first agreed to open source this code base out of HP and, and seed the community, there was intense concern about what happens if we start you know, just publishing the results of scanning you know, major released commercial Linux distributions and stuff like that from a who's going to be embarrassed at what they weren't paying attention to standpoint. Do you think enough time's gone by, enough things have gotten addressed already and so forth that um, you know, major embarrassments are, are not likely to happen here, or do you have any sense from the scans you've been doing of squeeze DVDs about, you know, how we stand with Debian? Just a few words on that would be interesting. Yeah, some of the, you know, uh, I mentioned that because uh, Fedora already had good lists, um, it was pretty easy to scan and, and look and see if they were compliant with their own uh, restrictions, and uh, I think when we did that, we didn't find anything uh, major popping out. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting is that for, for the public repositories that, that we have set up to do this sort of thing, um, we've only been doing things that we can freely um, distribute. And so uh, um, that means, you know, Debian and Fedora and that sort of thing, but it doesn't mean Red Hat Enterprise Linux or it doesn't mean some of these other things. Uh, because uh, um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that, you know, within the UI here, you can click on things and, and, uh, and download them. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I mean, it would take you forever, but you could get all the software, you know, via this web interface. Um, and so the decision was made that, yeah, we can't really scan uh, Red Hat Enterprise, Enterprise Linux. Although I guess presumably you could do um, CentOS, um, and that would be kind of the same thing, and that might be kind of interesting. We haven't done a scan on CentOS, but um, that would be nice to do. Yeah, obviously I'm not interested in embarrassing anybody. I didn't mean to point to any particular company or anything like that. It's just that I remember there was a lot of discussion about you want a tool like this to be perceived as adding value to the community's processes and not sort of destroying the community in the process. Yeah, not of, giving lawyers right. just the ammunition to go after them, yeah. Yeah. I, by the way, I, you know, I, I obviously, you know, I, 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 I had some small role in helping to, to get people convinced that you know, this is something, A, that we should do, and, and B, that we should open source. So I'm really tickled to see you talking about it here, and I, I hope folks in Debian will take advantage of this. <clears throat> you know, our FTP masters already do all of this work. They just do it by hand, um, or they've written some other little tools to help. And uh, I think the same thing's true with things like the Lintian lab. You know, a lot of people have done a lot of things to write code to, to iterate over source packages and all. If this ends up being a good infrastructure for, for making those things easier to maintain and, and use going forward, that's cool. Hi. Uh, so no, now you are doing this um, analysis on the complete Debian distribution with, I don't know, 15,000 source packages. So how do you actually uh, proceed from all these very detailed listings to find out what are the problematic cases? Yeah, so that's the, that's the first question, excuse me, and the okay. second question is, um, do you actually plan to include some, some logic in this, which, for instance, would find out which license is compatible, which other license? 
podcast, for instance, on, 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 on this boat, you yeah. can see many, many, many different licenses. So maybe you would like to find out one wh when they are not compatible. Yeah, and definitely. That would be a good idea. And I think that's been talked about. I think it's on the list of, of desirable things to be able to do, because obviously you have a lot of licenses uh, that aren't GPL compatible, and it would... Um, uh, what you need, I think, is a concept of at what granularity um, is the conflict bad, you know, when they're in the same directory. I guess you could do it at the directory level and see, like, okay, below this directory, we, we know we have two things, and one of them is um, GPL and one of them is non-GPL compatible, and have it flag that. Um, that would be cool. Uh, what was your first question again? How do you actually uh, do data mining on all this data that you get, say, on 15,000 source, source packages to find the problematic Yeah, cases? so the, I think the, the bucket browser is one attempt at helping you to find those sorts of things. Um, right now, a lot of it's very verbose um, and I think would require post-processing of, of some of the results if you're, if you're scanning something very large and you're trying to find uh, some things. And so uh, uh, some of the, uh, like right here, uh, you can you can down you know, with that link there. You can download the results, dump them to a file, and do some post processing and that sort of thing. The UI could be extended to do that. It just hasn't been yet. It's pretty crude in just letting you browse the results that are in there. But if you know the the UI is written to be pl pluggable as well, just like the agents are. And so you can drop in an agent that does a particular kind of scanning, and then you can also drop in some PHP files um, that then present the UI for your particular agent. You know, so eventually uh, I would like to do. You know, if we did a Lintian agent. Um, whenever the scheduler encountered De uh, Debian packages, it would fire off the Lintian agent that would scan it, put the results in the database, and then somewhere in the UI here, we would have something that, that was smart enough about Lintian to let you browse the results. One of the tricks about automating this, and I think that BDL's idea of automate, automatically analyzing the uploaded source packages is a great one. It's probably right in with continuous testing, is that um, we're going to be making... Um, this transition from manual inspection to automatic inspection has a risk about the quality of this. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, we could talk about the quality of manual inspection and the consistency of that, but um, how can we measure the degree of trust that we can have in these tools? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think, first off, we need to look at it as this is a um, not a crutch. This is a, a tool to help us do the the stuff that we're doing by hand easier and help help make our time more efficient, but you know, we're still going to be on the hook to make sure that that everything gets done properly. And so, uh, um, yeah, so I'm not sure how you avoid falling into that trap. Okay. Um, I know I was reading a, I think a, a maybe a year or two ago that they were Debbie trying to get a machine readable copyright um, project going. Yeah, that was the yeah. thing I mentioned earlier, and I'm not sure what, this, what the status of that is. Um, and I, I've heard there's uh, something going on even upstream as well to do. Um, I, I don't know if it's a machine-readable read copyright, but it's more just like a, a st maybe a standard boilerplate for what you put on the top of your C files um, that makes it a little more machine parsable. Um. I was just, <clears throat> just going to comment in response to Tom's query that I think one of the... The, the things that I find most interesting about this, and it's actually one of the ways that you know, I sit on HP's internal open source review board, and one of the, the ways this gets used a lot is we look at the deltas between sort of previous and current runs. Um, so there's, there's still this notion that at some point you have to decide that you've got you know, a clean archive. And you can use tools like this to help, but you know, the reality is I, I think if you asked our FTP masters, they would, would feel pretty good about their current Debian main archive. So the question then becomes, you know, there, there's always the possibility you discover something that got missed in the process of scanning a lot of it. So but the more interesting, deltas. yeah, the more interesting thing is, um, you know, well, what changed on this upload? You know, did did the list of licenses found in the tree change? And if so, is that worth a, a quick look by a human? You know, right now today, we do a lot of manual inspection of new, and um, we expect package maintainers to not be idiots about things they upload. And occasionally, people go and do some, you know, try to rebuild the whole archive, or they, you know, they, 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 do, they do various processing things. And often, these are done by people who are not core Debian developers, but they're people outside the project studying the project. And 
know, various people at different times look at it, but it's not like we have any systematic analysis of potential license changes or copyright reassertions or you know, bug fixes in the text of a copyright from an upstream maintainer. You know, we, we know these things happen. We see them happening. Those of us who maintain packages have had to, to deal with this stuff over and over and over again over the, the, the years. And I would think anything that helps us observe deltas in the same way that Lintian, for example, helps us understand if some policy has changed and we haven't been paying attention and our package is no longer compliant, um, this could help a lot with that sort of routine analysis. And this actually reminds me of something I wanted to mention, and that is um, when the change to the new architecture was made, um, when the unpacker is going through things, every time it encounters a file, it puts it in the file repository, and the way it does that is um, it, it uses a hashed directory scheme um, where it's the, the first bits of the hash are split into directories, and then the file name is uh, a combination, uh, I think it's a uh, SHA-1 and MD-5 and a size or something to make sure that there's like absolutely no possibility of collisions. Um, anytime it encounters a file, it puts it in the repository with that name, um, but then all the agent analysis is also driven off of um, that ID. Um, and so if an agent has already run on that ID, if it encounters it multiple times in the um, in the scan, that's just fine. So what that means is that we can do something like upload this week's squeeze DVD source one DVD. Um, it does all the analysis. When we upload next week's, um, as it's picking everything apart, it only has to rerun the analysis on the files that have actually changed, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and your, your comment about wanting to know about the deltas reminded me about that, uh, that you know, Fossology kind of inherently already knows um, about when files change and, or when, when there are new files um, and so it should be uh, possible in the UI to be able to say like, oh, hey, look, you know, these files changed and here's the new results as opposed to all the ones you've already spent a lot of time going over and looking at. Uh, right. Uh, there's been some uh, work funded by the EU looking at uh, automatic assessment of quality in software. And I was wondering if uh, people have been thinking about plugging filters into spot the quality of stuff. The other thing that occurs to me is that we had uh, a talk about automatic textual analysis of mailing lists a couple of days ago from Hannah, and that was really interesting. And I was, we've got a lot of data in the bug tracking system about how good or bad the code is. And yeah, you, someone you just, could, I, could I was in a sort of Bayesian filtering between the upload that introduced what was later found to be an RC bug. and then work out the sort of things that tend to introduce RC bugs. I mean, some of the time that's going to be just pointing at difficult code, but uh, some of the time it's going to be saying this particular structure in C is really dodgy. Yeah, I was in another uh, um, session at the time, but somebody else also already mentioned to me that about Hannah's talk about this could, could potentially be applied in falsology um, as well. Um, what was the last bit you just said? Because it reminded me of something. Oh. Uh, uh, matching RC bugs back to their where they're introduced, and therefore using the Bayesian. Uh, yeah, yeah. Analysis. Yeah, and anything you could think of, you know, any sort of scan you could think of that you could run uh, to be able to do such things, you know, should be easy to wrap an agent around it. And um, in some cases, that's uh, you know stuff at looking at, at uh, changes over time as well. So some of that would have to be at a, at a deeper level, but. Any other questions? I should actually defer most of these questions to uh, Daniel because he's the expert on this. Uh, yeah, so something I would say is that um, the people who run the license identification might not be the people who are capable of understanding the licensing constraints. For example, when you show uh, UCARP, there's mm -hmm. actually some uh, GPL with exceptions. Those are actually install SH if I, uh, so basically part of the autoconf automake system mm -hmm. and uh, or get text. And essentially, uh, this system, I don't even think that is, is, is GPL. It's just basically that it has some embedded components that they are copied by the configuration management system that do not impose conditions on this code. So yeah, there's I a think ton it's actually very, 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 very tricky and, and I think, uh, 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 it might sound wrong, but I think that uh, this is actually to be done by somebody who really understands um, licensing. Uh, 
because otherwise you can actually have this explosion of people worried about things that they should not worry, or the other way around, which is people that think that things are okay and they're actually wrong. Yeah, and the original tool that I mentioned that HP wrote, um, as they encountered things that were, were giving those sorts of false positives, they just coded in weird exceptions into the tool to tell it, oh yeah, yeah, just ignore config sub and config guess because we, we know that's probably okay. But that's, that's what I mean. Uh, they're, they're, they're not errors, they're not false positives, they are there. Yeah. It's just that the, the conditions allow you to use them in such a way. So they shouldn't be ignored by the tool, they should be reported. But the problem is that the interconnections of the different files make them difficult from the licensing point of view. And I think that's actually why we shouldn't use the, the, the term uh, false positive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just it's that a true positive. It's, yeah. it's a true positive, but in the way that the system is built, it is okay. Yeah, but at the same time, usability-wise, if you want to make it easy for people to do things, that we need some sort of system that, that allows you to have categories of things that, yeah, yeah, I know about that, that's fine, uh, but I don't want to see it, I want to see the... Th that's right, stuff, and yeah. that, that's actually way better than, 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 than to embed into the tool saying, I don't care to see these ones. Yeah, yeah. What you should be able to say is, is that some people might care to see these ones. And I, I, I totally agree with the idea that the lawyers are the ones who actually want to say, I want to be notified when something strange happens. And uh, so my time is actually dedicated to that. And in many cases, like config.h and .in, those are files that you will always find with GPL version 2 but those will really not affect your, your code. Uh, as a follow-up to that question, um, <clears throat> was, was that tool meant for, for, for lawyers to, to have a look at? Or, or like, like, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the process that, that they would go through to approve something. Like, were, were they actually looking at Phosology or, or were they relying on, on basically a developer going through using Phosology and producing a report yeah. saying that it was okay? I, I can give a quick summary, or Dale can give more, more notes, but, but the way it worked was HP had a, an internal process they called the Open Source Review Board, and that had was a team of lawyers, but also technical people, um, that any time anybody in the company wanted to do something. Yeah, so very early the idea was that we needed to have a review board that represented all interests. So in addition to legal folks and technical people who understood the software and HP's patent portfolio and all of that, there were also people representing um, open source community interests and people representing the business interests of the different HP businesses. So the idea was let's take a holistic view of each proposed interaction between open source software and some HP proprietary software content and ensure that the decisions we're making about what we contribute into the community, what we perhaps entangle ourselves in with uh, licenses like the GPL and where we are willing to take things in and use them in products are all conscious decisions. And over time, over time a set of heuristics sort of evolved about you know what makes a good decision and what should we use and one of the things we realized is we were spending a lot of time staring at source code in these weekly review meetings and that was fine when we had one or two proposals a week but when we had 20 or 30 proposals a week that fell apart so we started creating tools like this today um, lawyers don't tend on a daily basis to go look at these results themselves there are people who are part of a team that prepares um, proposals for review in our weekly review meetings who use these tools to generate you know, what amounts to a, it, it's kind of like a, a, I don't know what they call them, the, the folks who help lawyers do stuff. Um, but, but anyway, it's, Par paralegal. Yeah, paralegal. It's, it, it's like a paralegal kind of activity in that they are, you know, there are people who are really experts in this kind of stuff who use this tool to help prepare an analysis and still there are times when we look at something we go eh this is this is a little confusing let's go look at the actual source code let's go talk to the people who are actually doing the work and make sure but in a typical week when we're reviewing somewhere between you know one and two dozen proposals all but one or two of them you know end up we look at it and we go yep that's easy yep that's easy okay that's cool we can do that um, gee, this one sounds like a great idea, but our IP <laughs> licensing folks need to review this and make sure they're comfortable with our giving away that piece of, quote, intellectual property, unquote. And um, you know, that, that's how the process works. And no, 
uh, average lawyers don't read this. Um, we do have some non-average lawyers, though. <laughs> <coughs> they're the ones I really like working with. Uh, I think Moritz had a question, and that's probably about all we'll have time for. Well, uh, first I'd like the initial question, um, whether is Fosology Debian Net wired up to Debian LLAP? Can any DD log into it? It's or? not yet. We just set it up a couple weeks ago, and so far only I have an account. But uh, if people are interested, uh, I think the first thing we need to do is set down guidelines and, and structure about uh, where people can do things. But probably we'll create a user's directory, and then each user can have an area where they upload and other things. I'm hoping to have a, a public part of the, uh, um, the archive where we have all the... Uh, um, the snapshots of the distro, um, but uh, and I guess we'll have yeah we can talk about it. But I, I think it's definitely possible. Um, there's no way to tie it in right now uh, to Debian's authentication system where we can just give everybody one. So right now it'd be a special case kind of thing where I was like yeah I'll create you an account. So if you want to do that, um, just let me know. And I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>